Hi, everyone. Sorry about that delay. We're still mastering this. <laughs> Thank you so much, Zelia. Zelia behind the scenes, making it all possible. Zelia Raphael in Iceland um, and everyone else. Just welcome to Robust American Love. And I am Karen Carboner. I'm the president of the Walt Whitman Initiative. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. And our mission is to celebrate New York's literary legacy. Whitman is, of course, part of that. Uh, we're also an organizing center for cultural activism and poetry related events. This one is one of our favorites. So please follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Tune into our YouTube channel, as you are probably now doing, to explore many more presentations of this series. And if you like what we're doing, there are also many ways to support us. Uh, please visit the Support Us tab at our website. You'll see a PayPal link, an address for checks. We are fueled by our love of poetry. We're all volunteer, believe it or not. But we do need your help to sustain our programs, events, and initiatives. So we're really happy to have you here. Um, and even happier if you can help us out with what we try to do. Um, so this series, the speaker series, note that's not lecture, right, but speaker, uh, is to present timely and public-facing conversations on Whitman's life, work, and legacy, and a lot of non-Whitman, but Whitman-related, right, poetry-related events. And you will hear all sorts of different conversations, uh, teachers, poets, graduate students, artists, printers, neighborhood activists, they're not designed to be academic, but really free, open, informal discussions. So if you are tuning in live, you are always invited to ask questions in the chat. And if you miss one of our events, uh, they do get posted at our YouTube channel. So check those out over there. A few notes before we get to this very exciting conversation today. Uh, you can see from my background, Yop with us, <laughs> and the date that we have actually uh, finished, completed our fourth annual online global Song of Myself marathon. And I urge everyone to go to our YouTube channel and check it out. Uh, we had a broader global representation than we have ever had before. We had such eloquent, amazing recitations this time from Iceland to Japan to Venice, live from Venice to the UK, Mexico. Uh, so please do check out Whitman in all sorts of languages and delivered in all sorts of different ways. And pretty soon I'm going to have a very, well, not very, but somewhat different background for our Brooklyn Bridge Park Marathon, the in-person marathon that we host every year. It will be our 20th year this September 10th. That's a Sunday, and we really hope that you can come and stop by. The two marathons are quite different. Um, the one that's online, very global, tends to be much more theatrical and fluent. The one in the park is performative, so you will see all sorts of uh, yoga slash dance uh, slash uh, acted out slash um, oh god lassos you name it it's it's really brilliant and we're really grateful to Brooklyn Bridge Park Conservancy for hosting us on that. Well, we are in June. Uh, it's June 9th, 2023, and I'm really grateful that the skies are blue today after seeing orange skies for quite some time because of the Canadian wildfires. So things are looking up this month, and this month is also quite special just because of the amount of Whitman performance that is happening. And I'm sure that has something to do with Pride Month uh, here in the States. We're really proud to be in Pride Month. And of course, Whitman being an LGBTQ plus uh, icon, if you want to say that, um, he's the subject of a lot of different performances this month. So if you saw our last Robust American Love, you know that we interviewed the Tisch, the NYU Tisch Opera Project folks who just hosted three operas on Whitman and Audre Lorde. I went to check them out myself. Fantastic job, you all, on that. Fun hilarious, serious, meaningful, political. Uh, it was really a great way to start Pride Month. And then there are two more performances this month, later on in the month. And I think I wrote the dates down, June 21 to 24th at the Merchant's House Museum, which is in Greenwich Village. 
there will be a one man show called Whitman in Love starring John Kevin Jones, who is actually one of the readers this Sunday at the online marathon. And Kevin is bringing us Whitman in full LGBT uh, Q plus splendor and especially referencing the poetry, the poems Live Oak with Moss. And I think some of you know that Brian Selznick and I came out with a book in 2019, a new, a new type of experiential version of Live Oak with Moss. So we will be joining Kevin at Whitman in Love at the Merchant's House on June 23rd. We're going to be part of the after talk there. Really delighted to talk with him and with the audience about the ways in which the poems uh, meet up with and influence and shape the performance that he's going to do. So, so check that out if you are in town. And then even sooner, in fact, tomorrow, June 10th, at the Walt Whitman Birthplace, there will be the premiere, uh, a staged reading of a play called American Poet, Whitman's Warnings. Uh, it's directed by Milton Justice. Jared Hershkowitz is the producer. Walt is actually Eric Lockfeld. Maybe some of you remember him from King Kong or Misery or Metamorphosis here in the city. Uh, a really well-regarded actor. And we are very proud today to welcome the playwright, Sarah Vandershaft, who is a freelance journalist and a playwright and lives in beautiful Kennebunkport, Maine. Uh, Sarah, we're so happy to have you here. Welcome to Robust American Love. Oh, thanks for having me, Karen. It's great to be here. Well, we have not yet met in person, though I'm going to be so happy to meet you and to see the play tomorrow at the birthplace. So I'm really looking forward to that. And I, I really don't know a lot about your background and what brought you to writing a play about Whitman. So even before we get to the play, can you give us a little bit about like what led you in this direction? Yeah, so my background um, has always been theater, um, but you know, growing up, I was both a performer and then a writer, and um, I've um, spent the last uh, ten years or so focusing mostly on um, writing plays, but also as a journalist. And so, I was asked um, through um, a couple of people associated with. Um, the sort of the beginnings of this project, if you know, they brought me on board. Jay, um, who you mentioned as the producer, um, knew a little bit of my work, um, and I, I tried to write, um, or at least I'm interested in plays or creating stories that really look at people um, uh, in the context of the world that they're living in and how the forces of our of our world shape our experience as humans. Um, kind of what the specifics of our immediate world do for us, but also what transcends. Um, so for example, the play I wrote right before this one um, was about a couple uh, in an apartment um, right as um, the COVID outbreak um, uh, took place. And I was inspired by a, a friend of mine who's a journalist did a photo spread in um, Time magazine. And there was a, a couple that was essentially trapped in their apartment and they looked out onto a hospital and the white refrigerator trucks, you know, mm. lining the street. And I thought, what would it be like to be them? Um, and how was the world around them in this apartment creating their experience? Uh, so with Whitman, you know, um, my dear friend from college, Michael Prywis, who's one of the producers, knew of my work and he asked if I was interested in, in this project. And I like to joke that I was um, I was sort of ignorant enough to say yes, because <laughs> had I known quite how much there was to Whitman, I think, you know, the joke would be a wiser person would have said maybe not. Um, but in my naivete, I jumped in and it was such an um, antidote to sort of a troubled world to just mm -hmm. do a deep dive into Whitman. Um, and one of the thing that, things that kind of anchored me was um, I found in his voice, um, you know, the, the idea that he's a poet prophet and this comfort for a troubled world and a troubled soul. And so as I kept digging, 
uh, I just wanted to dig even deeper. And I spent the first year of the process uh, just researching and reading everything I could. And I kind of then read the poetry later. Um, I revisited that later in the process, trying to first get at his world and who he was as a, as a person, um, and then weaving uh, the poetry into the story kind of organically through his experience um, in America in that moment of time. Wow, that's a, a heavy duty reading list that you had there, right? And also the, I, I think for Whitman scholar or novice alike, the question about the man versus the work, right? Like how they relate and which one you go to first and Whitman purposefully conflating the two so that you often think that the eye of the poetry is the same Walt Whitman that's actually writing it when it really isn't true. So that must have been such an incredible road to travel. And I guess from what you were saying about the way that you work as a playwright, you're you're really interested in character, right? So maybe with Whitman, the the kernel of it is the person, right? Like you were really trying to get at the man who was behind the work. Oh, yes, absolutely. And in fact, I found reading his prose and his journals and his journalism, I could start to hear his voice mm -hmm. and his, um, uh, it, I don't know how to describe this, but, you know, I come from a family of journalists and I could hear in the way he wrote correspondence or his um, you know, his um, specimen days, you know, like reading all of that. I could kind of hear, like, I could imagine being in a room with him and the type of intellect that I associate with journalists who are, you know, citizens of the world and such voracious readers and consumers of the era they live in. And that excited me. And I felt a kinship to that because I kind of grew up you know, with those conversations um, in in the living room. And, and so, you know, I talked about this earlier, but, you know, everyone's going to come to Whitman, especially a playwright's going to come to Whitman with a lens that it's the lens that they bring and there are multiple ways of approaching him, but that was my way in. Um, and that was what kept drawing me in. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that you recognize his voice. And of course, you know, we associate voice so strongly with things, song of myself and all the references. But I always get this feeling that he's a good listener, you know, and that he actually spent quite a bit of time not necessarily talking, but listening to others. He's got this uh, phrase that I reuse with my students all the time that he says he absorbs and translates. So when he's, you know, just, I guess, I, I always visualize him hanging out at Foff Cellar Saloon. <laughs> And just, you know, with the the latest actors and actresses and great journalists of the time, but actually absorbing and translating that somehow into poetry. Um, so what a what an amazing trip. Now, I don't know anything about the play. I know the title, American Poet Whitman's Warnings, and I'm really intrigued with that last word. Could you tell us a little bit about what you mean by warnings in the play? Yeah, um, I think you know, on the sort of the first take of the word warnings, the play looks at Whitman um, as he experiences American democracy in crisis. And I really wanted to understand his relationship with America and, America and American democracy in the sense of, um, more than just a champion of the ideal and how the experience of living through a crisis challenged him and his understanding of American potential or um, uh, exceptionalism. And the idea, I think, and this we come to sort of later in the play, the idea that it's only as good as the men and women who make it, you know, we're not going to be held together by lawyers or a contract, he says. And so that, again, coming back to the humanity of it. And I think about 
the warning then that even today, as we go through these questions of either law or society, we have to kind of enter it with good faith that mm -hmm. we are at the end, our society will only be as good as the intentions of the individuals who make up that fabric. And so the warning isn't so much about the institution of democracy as the humanity beneath mm -hmm. it. That's at least what I, uh, what I believe, um, because I'm hoping that, you know, what plays can do as poetry is speak to us on a visceral um, level of humanity uh, and not just lofty ideas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's funny if you read his notes right before he, he writes Leaves of Grass in 1855, he's actually thought about making it a play. Right. Like in his private notes, he says, because he wasn't sure about the form. He had been writing short stories and journalism and 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 some poetry. And he says, what should I do? Like a novel, a play? It would have been really interesting to hear Leaves of Grass as a play. Right. Like I can't even imagine. But maybe you're getting close to that here. I don't know. Um, just a question about the crisis. Are you specifically talking about the Civil War as kind of putting American democracy in crisis, or when you talk about America in crisis, is it just a general feeling of the 1850s or? Well, what I, tr you know, again, and I, I have to preface this uh, as a playwright as saying, I'm not a historian mm -hmm. and a play is subjective and I'm creating the character of Walt Whitman in the context of a dramatic arc. And I wanted to know, or I wanted to present one way of looking at how he responded to his circumstances by, let's say, creating leaves of grass, you know, because that then takes up a lot of his life <laughs> after the, the beginning. And so I felt like I was trying to get to the point of what part of the American experience in that time, 1840s, 50s, 60s, pushed him and how he responded. And so I'm interested in how he personally felt threatened. Mm -hmm. So the Fugitive Slave Act and what was expected of him as a Northerner and how he might've been, let's say self-motivated in, mm -hmm. in his contempt for what was happening. And so not, cause I, I really struggled with understanding his relationship with abolitionism and his contempt for the shrill abolitionists, you know, and his fear of what, um, uh, you know, what was being asked um, and how uh, the delicate balance that he was in it, I felt trying to keep together that we can expand and stay together, you know? So I wanted to know what scared him mm -hmm. personally and why then, he, um, I think of it as um, a crisis that creates creation, you know, what, what pushes him to be the creative person that writes Leaves of Grass. And so I really wanted those forces, not just existential to the country, but to him as a human. Um, because I, at the end of the day, want to know how can we in the audience, how can we as individuals respond to our world through creation instead of just apocalyptic fear, <laughs> you know, whether it's what we saw in New York two days ago or yesterday or what we read in the newspaper, you know, so. Yeah, yeah to make something instead of just retreating into a passive role, right? But to think as, a, as an artist about what one can do, I, I think that's really powerful. Um, yeah, I always see Whitman's moment with that as, his decision to use and instead of or, you um, know, and I tell my students that, that he's very much the poet of and, which gets him in trouble and also makes the poetry really great. You know, mm -hmm. he's the poet of the slave and the slave owner uh, and, you know, goes through that in his notes. So um, and then the, the the issue with abolitionism is interesting, too, because later uh, he will say, oh, I was such a rabid abolitionist when he was younger you know, but when he's in it, I'm not quite sure that he's, he's really in that position. So he's, he's a, he's a very, very tricky uh, soul to negotiate. And I'm looking forward to seeing how you bring all of these really important discussions 
to the idea of a narrative, right? Because we've got Walt on stage in your play. And can you kind of take us through, well, like you're, you're, you're kind of saying kind of his New York years, I guess here, 1840s, 50s, 60s, but could you give us a synopsis about like sure. what you covered? I can try. So one of the okay. things that struck me about Whitman as I read, you know, um, was that I kept feeling that he existed on different planes all at once. Like I always went to this kind of cosmic being, you know, I never thought of him as just being, I guess what I felt is that he kind of broke through time and space, you know? And so- You would so I, love to hear you say that. <laughs> Maybe I was conscious it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I was like, this is so like, like yogi, you know? I was like, I was feeling that he was living, you know, beyond as much as he's the poet of the body, the poet of the soul. I was like, he's also like, he's just- in the cosmos, you know? And so the play is not linear. Um, it, 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 I think, and not, not to be cliche, but I found that it was like, the end is the beginning and the beginning is the end. Just like the tie, untying of the riddle is the, like all of that. <laughs> I was just, I had to embrace it instead of trying to fight it. Um, and so I'm not doing a good job describing No, that. no, you're, you're, you're getting there. <laughs> and it's great. You know, it's great. But, you know, to the extent that you can, the big question is what makes him, what made him, him, and how, what, how did he create Leaves of Grass? You know, what drove him to that? And, and what do we, what is that um, legacy for us? Like, why now do we care? And, um, and so I, I kind of took him at his word, you know, he is the product of one experience of the night. 19th century. And so I love the idea in Justin Kaplan's biography of him that he was a boy during the long sunset of the revolution. You know, mm -hmm. like to be a boy when that old guard is dying off. And I think in his poems, we see the ghosts of those men um, and women, we could say, but that legacy that he grew up with and to be, to meet, you know, the Marquis de Lafayette, right? Like the heroes of the revolution. So his idea of America is kind of born of that origin story in a way, but even in his youth, it's it's changing. And that, you know, he's growing up as those men die off and um, different motivations happen and then the expansion. And so, you know, there's this parallelism between the expansion of the country and the expansion of him. And then, oh. you know, the I think of his, um, uh, development, like I truly follow, we see him uh, grow into the printer and the man in New York, and um, uh, and so not not to to be too pedantic, but it's essentially the forces that then eventually drive him to creating Leaves of Grass and the re the 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 society's ability or inability to see what it is that mm -hmm. he's created. But it's not exactly um, uh, a linear um, storytelling as much as I think there is um, a true showing of his of his life. Um, and then um, the idea, I think, too, that um, to me was important was that. Um, I had to acknowledge that the audience is coming to Whitman with different um, backgrounds of knowledge. You know, I love that he, you know, towards the end, he would do all those speeches about Lincoln's assassination and and read, you know, Oh, Captain, My Captain. And yet it sounds like it was one of his least favorite poems. It's just like any writer who becomes known for the one thing that they, <laughs> you know, no longer can stand hearing. Um so I had to say, okay, half the audience is going to know that poem um, and maybe that's it. Yeah. And so the task for me was to integrate the life and the poetry hmm. so that it was um, still through action and not let's stop and just hear a poem, you know, um, and that, I don't know, for the reading that you're going to see on Saturday, to some extent, we can accomplish that. Um, 
in a full production, um, there are a lot of elements that would be visual or physical um, and not just through the words. Uh, because one of the big challenges was to help us see the poetry and the man and their connection and their separation. Right. Yeah. So maybe as a way of getting at like the particular scenes you've chosen, who are the other act, who are the other uh, characters in the play? Oh, yes. Well, it's so funny you say that because, you know, the not it's sort of a given that these days, if you want to play produced, you have to be mindful of of how many characters and uh, therefore actors you have. So, you know, six actors is is a pretty big cast to oh, wow. sort of produce um, in in a commercial setting, although you'll see, obviously, Broadway musicals with many more. Um, so I wrote the play and I had 86 characters. Oh my God. <laughs> and I had wow. a production note can be played by six actors. Oh. Okay. Because I, you, you know, we've talked about Whitman kind of being an observer in his own life. And, and so, you know, the, 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 the character of his mother, Louisa and the character, um, you know, she's a constant in mm -hmm. in the play but you know i have mr clark his first boss who gave him the library mm -hmm. card you know like how formative is that to let him right. you know the man who gets in the library like <laughs> that young boy would be huge and um you know i have him talking to james fenimore cooper who's you know a cameo part uh in his imagination um so i ha there are lots of people who float through um, Lincoln is a figure who never speaks, but, you know, in the full production, we would see just like I felt Whitman kind of looked at Lincoln from afar and was um, almost like a star of the moon. You know, he was always in his orbit, but never necessarily in contact. Um, so he's a presence. Um, his, um, um, you know, I've once seen at the tavern. Uh, <laughs> Um, and you would you would know who I'm alluding to. Um, oh, do you mean do you mean Fox Seller? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, the seller and, exactly. and uh, uh, Fred you Vaughn, know. the um, his major. I have. I, have uh, um, I think I have the uh, not Horace Greenley, but the other guy. And I have a scene earlier. Um, I've invented situations where he is hearing Emerson when Emerson was in New York. Um, I don't have the conversations they had together, but, you know, and a um, little cameo with Margaret Fuller, just, you know, whether or not the audience knows specifically who those people were in Walt's life, they'll know that this person influenced him mm -hmm. or that he's in conversation with them. Um, Frederick Douglass is a counterpoint at certain points. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then fictional, you know. Oh, cool. So it sounds like Eric Lockfeld, the guy who's playing Walt, is is primarily on the stage, right? Like he's the focus, the center, and then there are people who are kind of coming in and out of his life, so that you get the the sort of the the conception of of Leaves of Grass through that through that period of time. So so it's not so much scenes as Whitman kind of reacting to memory or to some sort of interaction with that momentary character. Yes, and I, I will say that there are discrete scenes um, that do happen, but with uh, transitions and um, there's sort of a magical realism that's, that that mm. allows us to break through. You know, we're not constricted to this scene and then literally, you know, what would happen right after that. It might not be in his life what really happened after, but rather uh, a theme that's that would be hmm. well it, it sounds a lot like what Walt does in the poetry like <laughs> thinking of the sleepers here and I know Zelia behind the scenes will know what I'm talking about but you know in a lot of the poems especially the big early poems like I sing the body electric and song of myself and the sleepers he's constantly drifting in and out of um you know different realities or or visions and he's got a quote in the sleepers, I dream all the dreams, but uh, and I become the other dreamers, right? I'm messing that one up. But uh, just that 
he's sort of the person who's the only one awake and kind of picking his way through all of these people who are either sleeping or imagining, and he's kind of gathering strength from them. So sounds kind of, you know, you're sort of like uh, poetically forming the growth of Whitman's mindset somehow. I I can only hope so. And I can hope that (laughs) the experience, you know, of, of being with the play is it's like the experience of living with a poem, you know, you has, mm-hmm. you're trying to replicate something that's very difficult to, you know, it's one thing you can't just show him writing a poem and feel like, Oh, I know what he's like as a poet. Like it's an experience. So the, the way the story is told in a way has, I hope um, uh, is infused with a mm-hmm. the sensibility that you feel with his poems. Um, yeah, he he just loved theater so much too. I think he would be so pleased, especially this month with all the productions that that yeah. kind of focus on him as a character. And um, you know, I I know you know this too, but he delighted in going to see theater and opera and, and almost anything on stage. And lived during a time when there were great orators and actors like Junius Brutus Booth, who would get up and recite The Raven in front of you know sold out crowds and hanging out with Ada Clare and Ada Isaacs Mencken and Charlotte Cushman, all the cross-dressing amazing actors of the day uh, down at Fafs. So I, I just wondered if his love of acting, did it factor into this? Like thinking about Whitman as a poser somehow, <laughs> his own love of, uh, I think he he even posits himself in the poetry as uh, the, the actor and the audience as the typical theater audience. So, so it seems like a really good mode to put him in there. Um, Did that come up at all? in while you were sort of formulating this and researching this, thinking about how he would actually enjoy and maybe present himself theatrically? Yeah. I have one scene when he's young, when he was a journeyman, a printer's apprentice, you know, where I have him with his case of letters and the idea is he's just been to a play and he's doing kind of the histrionic, um, Mm -hmm. you know, Richard III um, thing. Uh, So I think I love that in his, especially that he started going to theater around then, it sounds like, and that there was this kind of histrionic performance. And um, I read a bit about Edwin um, Forrest and Metamora and kind of what was the new, you know, what was this idea of theater at the time because New American acting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the muscular, you know, the sort of mm-hmm. muscular nature of it. Um, and even the mythologizing of our American story then, you know, like the oh. myth of the of the end of um Native Americans then, <laughs> you know, like just the um, so I was interested in what he was absorbing partly because then, you know, even the opera, because then what he creates is so free of pretense. Mm. You know, I, I found that I, I wanted to embrace the idea that he was absorbing it all and that he could be big, but that then he would find a truth that is so modern to us. Um, so, and and I have another section too in the in the play where I, I use one of his early poems that is, is quite bad. <laughs> oh I, yeah, those early poems, man, <laughs> they're not so good. We, you know, Do you we remember need, which one it is? The like, oh, fame, oh, yeah. this, it rhymes. It's vanity, I believe that yes, is. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, because he's trying. <laughs> and we need to see that what he ends up creating mm-hmm. took work and, and, a, and a stripping down of all of that. So That's a good lesson, right? To see yeah. where he starts with that imitative Gothic. Yes rhyming poetry I, I I really like to show also my students that because he's obviously appeasing the audience at that point and at some point in between that and 1855 decides to break free and create his own voice right to not follow a lead so yeah, yeah it's very exciting uh, oh yes and and I I think too you know to recognize um how bold it is to not do what everyone else is doing at the time and how risky that is um, 
Do you I'm, actually dress him as he appears in the frontispiece? You know, the really talking about daring and um, distinguishing himself, but, you know, no tie, the undershirt hanging out, the the Oxford shirt, the chinos. Like the, the, yes. The <laughs> in the 1980s, you know, oh, this yeah. complete freeing up of the the more uptight vision of what a poet is. So do we see Walt like that? I, I know you, t- it's a, it's a staged reading. So I wasn't sure if there is, there is costume and set or have you conceived that part of it? Um, in the script I have, and in fact, I had to make a very uh, deliberate decision as to when he has a beard. Because uh-huh. you know, if you're showing him, you know, obviously as a young boy, he doesn't, but I was like very aware that the audience a lot of the audience is thinking of him as the, you know, gray and the beard and all of that. But I was like, when in this story, is that what he looks like versus, you know, the other? And if he's transcending time and he's not, you know, if I'm not locking him into a specific time, when do I choose to have the beard given that flexibility? Um, For the reading, there are parameters that, um, you know, equity, the union, um, right, things has and so when we can't have costumes we can't do props so it's very minimal that way um but I think those elements because I I also love that apparently you know he carried what did he have a fan when he was in um Washington and it was so hot and he would carry an umbrella just the the sort of the the making of him or Mm -hmm when he's kind of in his dandy days, I definitely have a description of him with the, you know, the walking stick and his dandy frock, because then he'll get, he'll reject that. So Mm -hmm. all of those things, I think, help tell us a little bit about how he's choosing to present himself. Um, Yeah, the beard is a really interesting question, you know, because, uh, we have that the earliest daguerreotype of him, which was taken in New Orleans. Um, Denise Bethel, the she used to work at Sotheby's, but she did a, a, a dating of the. I think that must be you. Sorry. Oh my That's god. Right. I check that. Oh. Sorry. Okay. Uh, that's the program. <laughs> it's just Walt calling, making sure we say something about him. Yeah. 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 Uh, But in any case, that 1848 daguerreotype of him showing him as a dandy, right? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. His Abraham Lincoln style beard without the mustache, you know, just the the goatee style thing. Um, Very striking. But then, of course, becoming really known for the beard and, and writing about beards in Manly Health and Training, that serialized health manual that he wrote in 1858. But I often wondered because we only have one photograph of his father. Oh. And I, I know you mentioned his mother, but I really wondered if mm-hmm. you dealt at all with the very shadowy figure of Whitman Sr. Yeah. Um, you know, we've just got that one image and he's beardless, which kind of in the back of my mind, I always thought, did, did Walt actually get a beard soon to differentiate himself from his namesake? Uh, but he's a very problematic figure in many ways. And I wonder if you deal with him at all in the play. Oh yeah, I do. I do. You know, I, I also was curious to understand the influence of his father and partly because I felt that, well, his father exposed him to, you know, Elias Hicks, presumably, you know, and, and a lot of really big ideas, Uh, The line that struck me, I think, was in Justin Kaplan's book that he was hardened by failure. Mm. And so, um, and I was interested in Walt having to take on some of the father figure um, responsibilities in his own family. And um, and, uh, so for the most part, (laughs) and also the idea that he didn't want to do farm work, you know, and his dad was like, you got to (laughs) help. And he doesn't want to. So, you know, I use the father as a contrast to his mother, but also as a foundation from which he had to leave. Um, mm-hmm. And, um, but yeah, Maybe. there's some, sorry. Yeah, I just wondered if you touched, because there's a theory that he was an alcoholic and, and yes. possibly abusive to, to Whitman. Do you touch upon that at all? 
Yes, I have. The scene is Hannah finding Walt in the grass reading and saying, you know, father's looking for you. He's been with the jug again and and mm-hmm. he arrives inebriated and hostile, um, which um, I would think would shape Walt uh, to be both protective of his mother and also um, to grow up early, you know, with that type of father. Wow, it's really interesting that you say jug in there because I remember seeing at the birthplace, did did you see that too? The whiskey jug that they they believe is Whitman Seniors? Oh no, I haven't. Oh I well, I when you go that. tomorrow, you will have to see that. I mean, it's a slim line, but it's it's in the collection for a reason. And there's a little slip that indicates that this was once Whitman Seniors whiskey jug. So jug is the the operative and correct word to use there. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> wow. So, you know, he it's a huge family. You're dealing with the mother and the father. Do you do you deal with the siblings as well? All all seven of them? No, no. And I I you know, I I don't take them on the trip to Louisiana or any of that. I had to condense. Um, but I have Hannah, um, uh the younger sister, um in in, uh, in some of it and George uh is a figure especially leading him to Washington with the Civil War um but not as much as um you know uh, primarily it's Louis it's the mom um yeah you really have to pick and choose right like it's such a a, di- a complex story to wrap your head around um, but as far as like when you're looking at it now, and I guess it's not properly finished, right? Like you're you're kind of putting it out there and then you're going to revise and and sort of really, you know, it's it's a work in process still. But is there a moment in there that you're especially proud of, like a a moment that kind of either distills something or accomplishes something that you're that you'd like to mention? Yeah, well, there there are a couple. There's one moment that I think might bring unexpected joy, which I call the musical number, um, which is like uh, when Walt uh, is the editor of the Brooklyn Eagle and I have him talking about uh, Broadway and his love, you know, he, you know, how he's so loyal to Brooklyn, but he admits that New York's got one thing on Brooklyn, (laughs) Broadway, and he's you know, this is in his dandy days and he's walking around and he sees the people. And I, I took from, um, uh, you know, back in those days, the, I feel like the articles that the editors wrote were a little obviously different than today, but, you know, he's describing if there were a visitor to come to New York, what would they find most interesting about Broadway? And, and so, if it were staged, you know, it's like Walt with the world rushing by him, you know, and the the, the girls selling flowers and the, the Irishman who found his little boy's cap and just like this humanity around him. Um, and then another scene that I love is on the ferry, which I put him on the ferry in a practical way <laughs> so that later um, when we... Uh, feel that he is um, beyond our, you know, our realm. There's this idea of of um, uh, of a of journeying and and of the fairy. Uh, so you know, planting little seeds that I hope have payoff, um, and finding just this joy. Especially yesterday when I was walking through New York, feeling so oppressed. And so sad for sort of the planet. You were and walking through to... New York with the uh, with the orange skies and all the health <laughs> warnings. Yeah, yeah. And I was thinking about Whitman's optimism and his love of the sort of hustle and bustle, and trying to conjure that. <laughs> um, maybe the warning should be, you know, the the warning is 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 to be careful as we grow. But. Um, uh, yeah, and he, saw, he saw the city in really bad shape too. You know, in fact, um, I, you know, I, I'm not. I, this is probably too small for your play to to talk about. But in the beginning, when he starts the printing apprenticeship, his family moves back to Long Island because of the cholera, yellow fever. There were great ep- epidemics in the city without a a running water system. But Walt stayed 
to keep yeah. on printing, right? Until the the great fire of 1835 sort of devastated the print industry and he wound up moving out to Long Island also in 1836. But for a period of time, and that's like a very early teenager, um, he's really taking in a lot of New York. We think he lives in Manhattan at that time, but he is also walking amongst real tragedy just because he stayed when a lot of people left. You know, a lot of, uh, just, just like with the pandemic recently in Manhattan, just people go pouring out of the city when you have something on that scale happen to the city. So he stayed behind and, and actually witnessed it. And I feel like a lot of the darkness in those short stories that he wrote at the time come from that exposure to death at that time, you know, just so much darkness around him. Um, so, uh, so these moments, I feel like when you're creating them in the performance, it's going to evoke poetry that your audience loves, right? Like Crossing Brooklyn Ferry is the classic New York theme song. Um, does the poetry factor into the, the play? Uh, yeah, it does. In fact, that was sort of, uh, as we developed the, the script, we did a, a reading just, you know, amongst ourselves back in December, one of the sort of the decisions collectively was let's add more poetry. And my challenge was, okay, but I don't want the play to just stop and have it be poems read. You know, it has to sort of be in the service of the story. And so to the extent that that's successful, I think is still evolving. Right now I've added citizens um, and sometimes Walt says his own poetry, sometimes others say it. In the very beginning, I tried to be true to say, okay, if it's in 1855, I'm only using, you know, leaves of grass as it appeared then. And I'm trying to use <laughs> the version oh, no. that appeared then. And then if it's 18, you know, whatever, then I can go to the other. Day. And I was like, this might be too esoteric for a play. I had to give myself permission to fudge a little because, you know, he's always 10, I call it he's tending to his leaves mm -hmm. and the poems are constantly evolving. The same poem is different in different versions sometimes. And, and I, as um, kind of my journalistic background, wanted to be very accurate and true to what he said when, and eventually I had to let it grow a bit. Um, so I hope the, the true scholars in the audience understand the sort of poetic license of of what a play has to do, um, because if I get too locked into verisimilitude like that, I think it loses, you know, it loses some of the, the bigger meaning, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, you know, that was a challenge. Using the poetry was a big challenge um, because as you probably talk with your students, you know, sitting alone with the book is a is an experience in itself. How do you replicate that on stage without, you know, it's almost, it's so intimate and it's so meaningful to read. Does it diminish the meaning to mm -hmm. take it outside of how it was written? Um, so I was mindful of that, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, it's why we have a Song of Myself marathon. <laughs> Because the, I mean, many of the pieces def kind of ask for a performance, uh, you know, they're songs. Um, yeah. uh, yesterday, I was up in Rare Books, the Rare Books Library at Columbia, looking at the 1856 edition, which a lot of people don't really look at as closely as the first edition, the 55 or the, the 1892 deathbed. It's the, the second edition and Whitman is full of doubt and, you know, he's, He's questioning what he did in just a year earlier. And if it has a table of contents, which the 1855 edition of Leaves of Grass did not have. And when you look at it, every single one of the poems is called song, poem of this, poem of that. So it's poem of Walt Whitman in American is the first, poem of women is the second. And I feel like it is because probably that first edition, people didn't take the poetry seriously, right? They they just saw sort of like these free barbaric lines 
um, and Whitman kind of readjusting and recalibrating and reminding people that this is poetry. Um, but he himself, you know, he had this desire to, to have them jump off the page. You know, I feel like that's why eventually so many of them got titles like song. Um, and he, you know, you probably know this from Kaplan, he dreamt of being an orator for a while, right? He mentions that, that at this time of great oration that he, you know, he could, he could be that too. So back again to this idea of putting him on stage, it seems really appropriate. It is tricky though, I will agree, like how to put the poetry in there. When does it become an artificial stance, right? Where it sounds like, you know, it just doesn't sound like a play anymore, but more of a show. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, when you're evoking scenes like the crossing Brooklyn ferry scene, you know that people are just dying to hear, you know, I am with you, men of men and women of a generation. Yes. So, so very, uh, very interesting questions. Um, do you deal with his personal life at all? Like his, uh, you know, his attraction to men? Yes, 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 I do. And I did it, you know, I, so I think I, you know, I writing this play with um, a subjective point of view as, you know, who, what I bring to my understanding of Whitman. And I was interested in a couple of things. Um, the, um, his sexuality, I mean, his sensuality and his sexuality and um, and it's um, the attraction to men, but also what really interested me that I also tried to show were the women who felt in a, in a way um, seen and, and, and alive and his gentle carefulness with uh, letting them down easy, <laughs> right. you know? And I, I was interested in that because it would be so, it, it, to me, that's another aspect of, of his compassion. And you know how he talks about Leaves of Grass being essentially a woman's poem. And, and, and I know there's debate about how much he really went to bat for women. Um, but the idea that a woman could feel um, uh, like you can, she could acknowledge her sexuality or if she felt attracted to him and that he in a sense, um, acknowledged their feel, their sort of sensuality without rejecting them um, harshly, at least mm -hmm. as it seems, to me showed a sophistication that I found fascinating, a navigation of his world. Um, and, you know, um, I, but what I didn't do and I think another playwright will and do is yeah. make that the um, primary um, uh, source of, of the story. Um, and so it's clear and it's important and it's part of, um, of his whole story and a little bit of part of his loneliness, I think, too. This this mm. idea of um, being separate from from various things. Um, so I hope I, I hope I did justice um, to that. Um, but like I said, I I think um, I think there are different elements that I um, told and. Mm. And because it's a play, um, there's room for more. And it actually is, how long is the play? It's like an hour and a half. About an hour and a half. So right now, if all goes as according to plan, it should be 90 minutes, no intermission. Right. Which is, uh, to me, short, right? Like to encompass such a, a really complex series of questions and this person in the middle, it feels like you really have to, I don't know, choose your battles, I guess. Oh, because completely. I, I would say, like, talking to you now, I see that you are being very generous and saying, you know, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. I think what's really impressive here is what you did in mm. 90 minutes. Yeah. And I can't wait to see it, uh, just knowing that you've thoroughly researched and you you see the big picture and there are a lot of choices to be made. Um, 
So it's very exciting to, to have a playwright kind of approach this life and, and sort through it for us. Can't wait. Can't wait, Sarah, to see oh, it. Wonderful. Oh, I'm excited to have you there. And and it's like it's really been, I feel like Walt has been <laughs> Walt, <laughs> you know. Oh yeah, uh, Uncle Walt to many Uncle people Walt out there. Exactly. Yeah. Like the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway I had, and this is kind of existential, was I was feeling like he has uh he allows at least me to feel less afraid of whatever is unknown. You know, like he is. He's, he hooks his arm around your side, you know, and he's with us. Mm -hmm. and, he, and in a way I was, uh, I really felt like he makes it okay to die. Like he, he makes it okay to go into what's next because he'll be there. I mean, and that sounds so, um, uh, I don't know, um, pedantic, but like that was the comfort at the end of the day. I always felt from reading, from reading him. Yeah, it's a great thing. And, you know, his direct address to us is always mind blowing, you know, to, uh, the inclusivity of that. So, um, wow. I, I, any any words for the people who are watching who might be interested in trying the same thing? Um, do you have any words for a, a future playwright out there? Doesn't have to be a future playwright of Whitman, <laughs> but but just someone who's thinking about getting into the profession. Um, well, um, I'll say that, you know, as personally, what I, what I found was, um, you know, I, I think I, I mentioned to you at one point, just reading Justin Kaplan's book and seeing that in 1855, he had faced many failures. He had not really made it besides, you know, and he writes this, this work and he keeps at it. And in a way it just gave me permission. And I hope it gives everyone else permission to say, you know, do it and then yeah. keep doing it. And, and, um, uh, and I also respected from him that he was very firm with what he believed, but also I could be wrong. <laughs> you know, he kind of said, and I might be wrong. Um, I, I thought he kind of, he seemed inspiring in that way. Um, so, um, that would be my advice to take from him. Um, is that? Yeah, I think for for people who are seeking to do something out of the ordinary without much support, and maybe with not a lot of encouragement as they continue their paths, he's a great role model for this, right? And I was thinking also the other day about his self-promotion which a lot of people laugh at because, oh, he writes three self reviews of his book when he's, you know, doesn't have anybody else doing it. But honestly, it's a good lesson, right? <laughs> because sometimes you are the only person who's going to think that you need to be promoted and, oh, yeah. Yeah. That, and you have to do the work yourself. So uh, as funny as it is, maybe it's not too wrong. I mean, I mean, he did build himself into a quote unquote America's poet out of nothing. So uh, a lesson for us. Sarah, it is such a pleasure to talk to you. I can't wait to meet you in person. Um, you're exuding really warm, positive energy. And it sounds like an amazing uh, production, trying to, trying to do a lot and a lot of good also. So I want to thank you for spending an hour with us here and thank everyone who's watching and the future watchers and to stay tuned for another robust American love coming up. But for now, if you're around New York tomorrow at the Walt Whitman birthplace in West Hills on Long Island, uh, Whitman's warnings, oops, I'm going to get it backwards. America's poet Whitman's warnings is going to be um, read in a staged reading at 4 PM. I will be there, Sarah. So Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Zelia Raphael, for actually making us possible. And um, stay tuned, everybody. Sarah, have a great day. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.